Tonight I want to talk about the Apostle Paul. You know, we have this website called remnantexodus.org. And we have a free seminar on that website. We just recently posted a new opening video for that. And you might want to check that. And one of the teachings that's part of that series talked about the origins of Christianity, of the Christian church. And really, we had so much information. Of course, we couldn't present everything that goes along with what we had there. So, from time to time, we want to bring in some teachings that go along with all of that material that will kind of fill out some of that for you and help you understand more about it. And since we are getting close to Passover, Passover is just one month away from this point, I thought it would be a good time to visit the Apostle Paul and see if we are being told what the Apostle really taught about Passover. This might be helpful in talking to others. Basically, this is what we find in Christian Bibles. We have an Apostle Paul that has conflicting opinions. Now, this is true on many things. For instance, on the Torah. He often refers us to the Torah as if it's an authority, and then, according to these translations, he tells us the Torah is all over and we don't need it anymore. We have this particular case about the Passover festival. Here you see in 1 Corinthians chapter 5, he says, let us keep the festival. So he's advocating that we keep the Passover festival. But then in Colossians, he says, don't let anyone judge you by a religious festival. So which is it? Do we keep the festival? Do we not keep the festival? Is it just a personal choice? You know, what is it that Paul is really saying? Well, the way things are reported to us in most Christian Bible translations, you can find a verse from Paul to pretty much support any position you have. And my question would be about Paul, why is this? Was he really just kidding with some of these? Is he really disconfused? Some people say he was a false apostle because when they read these things, they say, well, no true apostle would be contradicting himself like this. And so they don't believe in Paul because of these really many apparent contradictions that we find in our Bible translations. So we're going to pick a case like this. You can see here, he says, let us keep the festival. And then we're going to take a closer look at the place where apparently he says we don't have to keep the festival and see if that's what he really said or what was he really saying. We're going to look at this very closely. And by the time we're done, you're going to be able to look at this verse and decide for yourself whether this is translated correctly or whether it's putting words into Paul's mouth and obfuscating what Paul is really saying. Well, before we get to that, we do want to talk a little bit about Paul. Um, Paul's Hebrew name was Saul, or Shaul. And the scriptures say he was called Paul. So Paul was his nickname. And actually, it means little. Maybe he wasn't very tall. So that might be where he got the name. As we read through the New Testament, 
the certain things that we find there about him, and that is he identified himself as a Jew. He says he worshipped as his forefathers worshipped. We find that he regularly attended the synagogue on Sabbath. He believed in the Torah and the prophets out of his own mouth. He kept the Torah, he says. He taught those of both Jewish and Gentile ethnicity to keep the commandments. And nowhere in Scripture does Paul indicate he's starting a new religion. Instead, he was advocating entry into the renewed Israel through faith in Israel's Messiah. I identify pretty closely with Paul in some ways. And I'm going to explain to you how that is. You know, Paul was raised up studying the Scriptures. But basically, he was raised up into a Jewish cult. Now, some might object to that, but nevertheless... The biblical definition, the dictionary definition of a cult certainly does indicate rabbinical Judaism. And that's what Paul was a part of. Now, what a group like that does is they form their own idea, their own doctrine, their own understanding, their own tradition, which they then support many times through the scriptures. So this is how it was with rabbinical Judaism in the first century. They had a very intricate belief system, and many of these things that they believed, they supported with scripture, but many, many times what they were advocating actually went far beyond scripture. Paul called it the commandments of men, as did Yeshua Messiah, the commandments of men. So, you see, on the one hand, we have the commandments of Yahweh, Yehovah himself, and we find those in the Torah. But on the other hand, we have the commandments of men, which is basically all the things that a given religious system adds on to the scriptures that you must keep in addition to the scriptures, which in many cases negates the real meaning of the scriptures. Now, I have personal knowledge of this because I was raised in a religious cult. And I was very zealous for the scriptures from the time I was a little kid. Before I even went to school, people used to call me the little minister because I was so enamored with the Scriptures. And I was always talking about the Scriptures. But I was not taught according to accurate knowledge. I was taught according to the dictates of the group that myself and my family were a part of. And it took me, as it did Paul, a supernatural experience to happen in my life to set me free from the brain chains and the mind control of false religious teachings to really see the glory of Messiah revealed in the Word. So that's the way in which I relate to Shaul or Paul. I had this releasing happen in my life that I see with him. So when I read his words, I'm constantly seeing that. I'm constantly seeing how he is motivated by this release that happened through meeting Yeshua Messiah. And many times this gets obscured through faulty translation of what he's really saying. Now, I'm going to get into this some more, but I just want to show you what the believers in the first century, the early part of the second century, 
thought about this particular issue, and that is keeping the appointments in Scripture, including the Passover, the Sabbath, and other things. Now, this is a review in some way. For instance, we talk in that Remnant Exodus seminar about Clement, and he was the Bishop of Rome from about 92 to 99 AD. And he was a Gentile believer. He was an elder. And he taught the people what the apostles taught him. And we have a letter from Clement. So this is outside the New Testament Scriptures. And this letter is very interesting, First Clement, because among other things, we find Clement encouraging people to keep the commandments and the ordinances of the Lord. This is what he says. And he talks about the offerings and ministrations at fixed times and seasons, indicating that he kept the appointments and encouraged the other believers, whether Jewish or Gentile, to keep these appointments also. This is what the norm was among all believers in the first century and going into the second century. Now, just for a second witness on that, we have the Didache. And this is really a rather amazing document when we read it translated correctly. And the Didache is basically meant to help new believers to get oriented to the faith. And it includes, among other things, this admonition, you must not forsake the Lord's commandments, neither adding or subtracting. So the Didache was encouraging all believers to keep the commandments, don't add anything to it. So you see that idea of religion, adding other things, that was out. But keeping what the commandments actually say, that was in. That's what the believers were to do. That's what they were taught by the apostles. This is very much in harmony with what Yeshua Messiah said in Matthew 5.18 not even one smallest letter or one tiny pen stroke shall in any way pass away from the Torah. So this is how the early believers believed. There was no two messages. There was one unified message, and it included keeping the appointments. Well, this is how it was until you get close to the middle of the second century. And as we show in the Remnant Exodus seminar, that's when the great Gentile schism occurred. What you're seeing here is a picture of a couple of the early Christian church fathers, Justin Martyr and Ignatius. And Justin Martyr was actually the first to depart from the faith as it was handed down by the apostles and to come up with a new way of explaining Paul and explaining the Scriptures. For example, we have this quote from the Jewish Virtual Library. And it says, the first apologist to vilify the Jews was Justin Martyr. And it mentions his dialogue with Trypho, who was a Jew. And if you read that dialogue with Trypho, you will see him spiritualizing most of the commandments, the appointments. And as it goes on here, it says, Justin Martyr's writings became incorporated into early Christian thought and were the origins of Christian anti-Semitism. 
So that's what happened. Now, in the Remnant Exodus seminar, we explain why this happened at this time. Because it wasn't really acceptable anymore to hold to anything that was considered Jewish. And so the Gentile believers basically felt like they had to jettison the Hebraic believers in order to be in good standing in Gentile society. But to do that, they really had to change their thinking and their teachings about the Scriptures. Because, of course, Israel is at the center of the Scriptures. So, what happened since Justin Martyr is the Christian church grabbed a hold of the Apostle Paul, of course, who is now dead for decades, and they reinterpreted what Paul said as a way of justifying their schism away from the true early believers. And since there were many more Gentiles than there were Hebraic believers and faithful Gentile believers, it's really this heresy that became mainstream, while basically the truth that was still carried by the believers who were following the way of the first century believers, that truth became hated and was essentially driven underground. So, through the centuries, what we call Christianity is this distorted set of beliefs rather than the actual beliefs of the early believers. And we're going to look at an example of this tonight, and you can judge this for yourself what I'm saying. Now, we mentioned this verse at the beginning, Colossians 2, 16 and 17. Here it is in the NIV, which is today probably the most popular Christian Bible. It says, Therefore, do not let anyone judge you by what you eat or drink, or with regard to a religious festival, a new moon celebration, or a Sabbath day. These are a shadow of the things that were to come. The reality, however, is found in Christ. As we read this passage, what is it really telling us? Isn't it telling us this is a personal choice, right? What we celebrate, how we celebrate. It mentions a religious festival. That would be any kind of religious festival. And nobody can really tell us uh, or judge what we're doing. It's totally up to us. And it's putting these words into the mouth of the Apostle Paul. Well, we want to look at these words more closely and see if this is the case. But, you know, most people that read these verses, what they're thinking is, well, this is the Bible. This is the Word of God. This is the truth. That's what they're thinking. And when we get around the time of year where there's a biblical festival or even a worldly holiday, many times if you say something about keeping the biblical appointments, people spout this verse back to you. This is really the only verse they have, by the way, in the New Testament that supports this idea that those appointments are done now. But they cling to that. Now they cling to it for two reasons. This is a proof text for two things. It's a proof text, first of all, for the notion that we don't need to be keeping the biblical appointments. So we don't need to keep the Sabbath anymore. Even though it's one of the Ten Commandments, they tell us we should keep the Ten Commandments. 
but for some reason, they take just one out of the ten and say, you don't have to keep that one. And basically, this absolves Christians from keeping any of these days. But it also works the other way. This is a very handy passage for them. Because if nobody can judge you as to a religious festival, then if you want to celebrate a holiday that's based, for example, on paganism, like, for instance, the Roman Saturnalia, which became Christmas, or Easter, named after the false god goddess, actually, Astarte, with its symbols of fertility, like eggs and bunnies. Or even Halloween, where you're actually celebrating the demonic power at work in the world. Well, nobody can judge you for that, according to these verses. That's your prerogative. You can celebrate the demons all you want. Do you think that's really what Paul said in these verses? Well, let's take a closer look at these verses in a form where we can tell what they actually say. Now, this looks kind of confusing to some folks. What you have here is verses from the King James Bible, just copied directly out of my eSword, which is an electronic Bible program. The numbers that are in green here indicate the actual Greek word for each of the words listed here. So what you can do with this is you can look up a passage and you can go through and actually check the dictionary, the Greek dictionary, for the meaning of every single word because this is an amazing resource. Every single word in the Scriptures, both the Hebrew Scriptures and the Greek Scriptures, is numbered. And the definition of that word given. So even if you don't speak Greek or Hebrew, by using this method, you can go through and you can see for yourself what every word in any passage means. Now, Probably most of you know about this and use this. But I'm explaining this in some detail so that those of you who haven't yet encountered this method of study can use this for yourself. And you can actually test other scriptures and do the same thing with those other scriptures that we're doing together tonight. So what I'm trying to teach you here is not only about this particular verse, but also how you can apply this method to dig more deeply into the Scriptures. So as we look at this, this is what the King James Bible says. This is how it translates these verses. It says, Let no man therefore judge you in meat, or in drink, or in respect of an holy day, or of the new moon, or of the Sabbath days, which are a shadow of things to come, but the body is of Christ. That's how you find that translated in the King James Version. Now, there are some folks that say about the King James, it was translated in 1611, by the way, that it is the inspired Word of God. In other words, they believe in something called King James only. And because it's in the King James, they believe it without doing any further study into it. The truth is, as you look at the text here, what you find is two words that were added. Notice the word days. There is no Greek number for that. You notice that? 
there's no number there, and it's indicated by the fact that the word days is in italics, so it's telling you it's not in the text. And then near the end of verse 17, the same thing is true of the word is. That word is does not have a Greek number, and it is indicated by italics as having been added to the text. But what we have then is only two words in the entire passage that are added to the text. And as you're going to see in a minute, this is a lot closer than other more modern translations, but it is still adding thoughts to these verses. Now, one other thing I want to direct your attention to before we move on is the Sabbath. You notice it has the Strong's number there, and I've put that along with the definition underneath the passages. And as you look at this, in the verse it says the Sabbath days. So this would give you the impression that it's talking about the weekly Sabbath. But actually the word is sabaton. And sabaton is not only the Sabbath day, but as it points out here, it is also the observance of the institution itself. It is also the interval between two Sabbaths. Now that's a very interesting comment, the interval between two Sabbaths. It doesn't say the seventh day. It says the interval between two Sabbaths. And it also says the plural in all the above applications. So obviously with this word sabaton, it has a much wider meaning than simply the Sabbath day. And uh, we're going to look at that more as we go along. Now it also mentions an holy day. This is Old English for a feast or a festival. The new moon, the NIV says a new moon celebration, but it doesn't say that here. It says the new moon, and the new moon actually marks the beginning of the new month. So when it's talking about the new moon, it's actually talking to us about setting the calendar each month. And that's why it's using the word sabaton, because it's talking about Sabbath periods. So when you talk about the new moon and then you talk about Sabbath periods together, what you're talking about is establishing the calendar and the things you do on the biblical calendar. This is talking about the Torah calendar, friends. That's what it's talking about. Now we return to the NIV passage. And if you count through this, as I did, there are at least 12 words that are added to the passage that do not exist in the Greek. I have put a red square around those words. 12 words added. But just as importantly, there are four words that are included in the Greek text that are completely missing from the NIV passage. So whereas the Didache tells believers, don't add or subtract anything, the NIV has added and subtracted quite a bit. As a matter of fact, as you look at this and you add this up, 30% of this passage in these two verses is completely spurious without any backing from the Greek. And if you change 30% of any message, are you going to get the true message? And why do you have to do that? Why should you have to actually change the message by a factor of 30%? Doesn't that make you suspicious right there? 
Well, in order to understand what the passage really says, we obviously can't look at the NIV. So what we're going to do is we're going to go back to the King James Version with the Strong's numbers. So as we look at this here, we notice in contrast to the NIV, we have two words that are added to the text. That's not quite so bad, is it? Also, the word Sabbath is not a full translation of the word sabaton. So this would be another problem. This is written in archaic English, so that makes it a little hard to read. But nevertheless, even the archaic words here do accord, for the most part, with the Greek. So what we want to do now is we want to take the passage as it exists here, check it against the Greek, and simply remove the words that are not from the Greek text. And we're also going to remove the punctuation because punctuation in the Greek, the translation of the Greek is completely arbitrary. There is no punctuation in the Greek language. So that's always added. So let's just take that out completely. And this is what we end up with. So let's read it. Let no man therefore judge you in meat or in drink or in respect of an holy day or of the new moon or of the Sabbath, which are a shadow of things to come, but the body of Christ. That doesn't sound much like the NIV to me. And it doesn't even sound exactly as the King James sounds when you add these other two words. So, let's look at this now again a little more closely. Here's a simple direct translation of these verses simply using the Greek dictionary. We have first from the King James, let no man therefore judge you in meat or in drink or in respect of an holy day or of the new moon or of the Sabbath, which are a shadow of things to come, but the body of Christ. Now that's a little awkward, particularly without any punctuation. However, when you realize that this part where it says, which are a shadow of things to come, is a parenthetical statement. In other words, it's a statement that is injected into the thought. And you know, people often do this, right? While they're talking, they add a little word of explanation in there, and then they continue their sentence. That's what Paul was doing by putting this little phrase in there right there. So you'll see that I've done a translation now below this, and I've indicated this parenthetical statement by putting it in parentheses, because in English, that's what you do with a parenthetical statement, right? You put it in parentheses. And I've put a period at the end of the passage, because it's the end of the passage. That's what you do in English. Now, other than that, there is no punctuation that I've added to the verses. So the punctuation I've put in is completely justified by translating this Greek into English. Now let's read it with this little bit of punctuation, word for word, as it appears from the Greek. Let no man therefore judge you in eating or in drinking, or in respect of a feast, or of the new moon, or of the sabaton, which are a shadow of things to come, but the body of Messiah. So what is the verse telling you? It's not telling you that nobody can judge what you do. Nobody can judge you whether you're 
worshiping the devil. It's not telling you that. It's also not telling you that nobody can judge you because you are not obeying the Scriptures in keeping the appointments. It's not saying that. What it's saying very clearly is, don't let anybody judge you in these things, but the body of Messiah. How simple is that? That's what the words actually say. Let nobody judge you in these things but the body of Messiah. Now, just to add more to this, so you can see I'm not in any way making up this interpretation. You know, I'm just going by the words. But let's look at the context and see what Paul says as he continues here. And you see if this fits the context. Now we go on to Colossians 2, 18 and 19 from the King James Version. Let no man beguile you of your reward in a voluntary humility and worshiping of angels. Intruding into those things which he has not seen. Vainly puffed up by his fleshly mind and not holding the head from which all the body by joints and bands having nourishment ministered and knit together increases with the increase of God. Now when you add those verses, isn't it very clear that when Paul says let no man, he's actually talking about religionists who do not know Messiah, who are not holding to the head, Messiah as the head. And doesn't that accord exactly with the point just before this in verse 16 and 17 where it says, let no man judge you in these things but the body of Messiah. And Let's look a little more closely what it's talking about. Let no man beguile you of your reward in voluntary humility and worshiping of angels. He's talking here about rabbinical religion. In the traditions, the worshiping of angels is included. And a lot of rabbinical teaching is voluntary humility. In other words, Traditions that go beyond what the Scriptures say in a show of outward humility. As a matter of fact, Yeshua Messiah addressed this himself when he talked about the scribes and Pharisees, and he said how they put on a big show when they're fasting. Well, this was part of the religious traditions. And instead he said, don't let anybody know you're fasting. It's something between you and and your Creator. This is a show of humility. It's something that's a religious tradition. And Paul is saying, don't let these people beguile you into keeping these religious traditions that make you look like a devout believer. And he says these are vainly puffed up by his fleshly mind. Now, if you know Paul, you know he talks about two kinds of things. A spiritual mind and a fleshly mind. A spiritual mind is a mind fixed on the Spirit that is hearing from Messiah. And a fleshly mind is a mind that is not receiving of that Spirit because that person is not in union with Messiah. So Paul is clearly saying, don't believe these cultists. Don't let them tell you what the calendar is. That's what he's saying. Don't let them tell you when you should celebrate these different days. And don't tell them how you need to celebrate those days because that is in the hands of the body of Messiah. He was drawing a line of separation 
between the messianic community and the unbelieving community. That's what this is about. Now, in verse 19, he talks more about these people. And he says, not holding the head. The head, of course, is Messiah, right? From which all the body, by joints and bands, having nourishment ministered and knit together, increases with the increase of God. We don't understand that at all today. And I'll tell you why. Because what is commonly taught is that everyone who is a believer is part of the body of Christ. So, basically, we just pretend we have this unity. We just kind of pretend that we're all knit together. But you know what? Believers are not all knit together. We have hundreds of different denominations, and they all teach different things. They're all under a different authority structure, and it's all confusing. The way it was in the first century is the head, Messiah, before he ascended to heaven, put a mantle of authority on the shoulders of his brother James to be the earthly representative of the house of David and over the true Israel, believing Israel. And James, along with others of the house of David, continued on the Davidic covenant to provide leadership among the believers. And then along with that, you have the ministry of the 12 apostles. You have the ministry of the 70 elders. And, of course, you have other ministries. You have other kinds of traveling apostles, such as Paul. You have local elders and ministers. You have people having various different kinds of spiritual gifts. And all of this coming from one central source, from Yeshua Messiah. And literally, all of the first century believers were all bound together in this unity. So when Paul is talking about actually fixing these days and celebrating them and so on, according to the body of Messiah, he's talking about keeping the unity in the body and not being thrown off because some unbelieving rabbi somewhere says, well, do this or do that. Because this is something that was happening a lot in the first century. These Messianic believers were always being criticized by the rabbinic cult because they were not doing what the rabbis wanted them to do. They were not keeping all of these rabbinical traditions where those traditions conflicted with what the Scriptures were actually saying to them. Since they were tied in with the head, they had Messiah Himself and His Spirit to explain how all of that was to be applied. And Paul is saying that's where you need to look about these things, to the Messianic congregation. Now I wish I could tell you that today all the believers are united together in the same way as they were in the first century. And unfortunately, I can't tell you that. Because we did have this big schism that happened in the second century. And because of this spirit of division that entered in at that time, the dividing has never stopped. And even within the Messianic community, it continues to happen. The dividing hasn't stopped. So we have all these different groups that continue to not hold to the head. And so even though we have these different groups and they claim to be believers, if they're not holding to the head and they're not in harmony, with the authority structure that Messiah has appointed, then really we can't let them judge these things either. 
what really has to happen is Messiah himself needs to reinstitute this authority in a way where those believers who are in touch with him can see it and they can come together and be in unity with it. And of course, I wouldn't be telling you all this if I didn't believe that we've got that right here. We are in touch with the head. And what I'm teaching you and showing you is what the scriptures say about these things. And what we believe and what we see happening is that as Yahweh raises up the remnant, more and more of them are pulling together into this unity. And it's a process. It's a lot like the book of Ezekiel where it talks about the bones. You've got a valley full of bones that are not attached. And so there's a process that goes on as the wind of the Spirit is blown. Those bones start to rattle. And he pulls them together more and more. Then the sinews can come on them, the muscles can come on them, the skin, all the vital organs, until the body of Messiah, the true Israel, actually stands up upon the dirt of this ground, of this earth, and manifests Messiah in the world. This is our vision here. This is what we see. And this is what we are working forward to every single day. This is what the remnant exodus is about. This is why we're going home in the second exodus, because that's going to enable all of this to happen. But that's all another teaching, really. We want to stick to these particular verses right here, and we want to see how the Christian Bibles have distorted what Paul was really saying, and that there is no contradiction here. Paul says in one place, keep the feast, and these verses do not contradict that at all. He simply is adding here that this is under the province of the body of Messiah and not outsiders. Now in saying this, I'm not saying to you that the rabbis through the ages do not have certain wisdom that they have acquired, that they do not have knowledge of history that is useful to us. There is a lot that has been carried down through the millennia within the rabbinical system that is useful. But the question is the question of authority. The authority over these matters does not lie with the rabbinics. And when messianic congregations look to rulings of the rabbis and traditions of the rabbis to govern what the congregation does, they are really going against what Paul said right here, and they need to correct it. I'm not saying they're not believers, but I'm just saying we're in this change process. This is a change that is very necessary. Now, to support that, I want to point to Isaiah chapter 8. These verses talk about the coming of Messiah the first time. They talk about this particular period I'm talking about when Paul lived, okay? And it was a period of transition that was going on. And in Isaiah 8, it says, He, meaning Messiah, shall be for a sanctuary. Yes, there would be some that would come to Messiah and see him as a place of safety, of sanctuary. But then it says, But for a stone of stumbling and for a rock of offense to both the houses of Israel, for a gin and for a snare to the inhabitants of Jerusalem. So basically, the prophecy was you have two groups. You have those who would see Messiah as a sanctuary. And then you have others of Israel, of both houses of Israel, that would actually stumble over the Messiah as a rock of offense. 
they would be ensnared, and it talks specifically about the inhabitants of Jerusalem. And then it says, many among them shall stumble and fall and be broken and be snared and be taken. History tells us that's just what happened. But it doesn't say all of them. It says many, many among them. So who is not included? Well, it's those same ones that choose Messiah as their place of sanctuary. The next verse makes this very clear. Bind up the testimony, seal the law, that is the Torah, among my disciples. You see what we find here in prophecy, and interesting, this is Messiah actually talking through the prophet Isaiah, that at this particular point in time after he comes, this is when there would be a change. And the testimony, which are the commandments, and the Torah, essentially would be moved away from those that were stumbled. That would be rabbinical Judaism. That itself was a schism away from the Messiah. It would be moved away from them, and it would be bound up and sealed among the disciples of Yeshua Messiah. Why? Why should I even have to answer that question? These are the ones, the disciples, that received Messiah. These are the ones who are in touch with the king of Israel. Are they not the ones then who are going to understand the Torah correctly? They have his spirit. They are actually being led by him. And so therefore, that's the authority that Messiah has set for interpreting the commandments and the Torah. It's been taken away from the unbelieving Jewish cult. So, it doesn't say the testimony is over with. It doesn't say the Torah is over with. What it says is, it is now under the authority of Messiah's disciples. Very simple. And as we've seen, what Paul was saying accords perfectly with this prophecy from Isaiah. And that is that authority over these issues, including over the appointments, has been put into the hands of the body of Messiah, the disciples of Messiah. So it is no longer in the hands of the rabbinical sources. So you can't look there for direction and authority on those issues. That's what Paul is saying. That's what the prophet said. That's what Yeshua Messiah himself said. And none of that contradicts anything that Paul said anywhere else. So if we were to sum it up in a simple statement. Paul didn't say, oh, go ahead and celebrate those pagan holidays. Nobody can judge you for that. He didn't say, oh, it doesn't matter when you celebrate Sabbath or if you even do. He wasn't saying that. What he was saying is we're not to let ignorant religionists, and by the word ignorant, I don't mean to be demeaning to anybody. I simply mean ignorant of the head. Yeshua Messiah, not in touch with him. Paul said we're not to let ignorant religionists judge our observance of Torah appointments. All such Torah observance is rightly the province of the connected body of Messiah 
his true disciples. Now, there's just one last thing I want to say about this. In about a month from now, in fact, in a month, a lunar month from now, we're going to be keeping Passover. And there's lots of people who want to keep Passover, but they don't. Because they think that to keep Passover, you have to do a Jewish Seder. Now, there's a lot of good things in a Jewish Seder. And I think it's a great thing if you have an opportunity to observe one sometime or be a part of one. But here's what you need to know about this. You don't have to keep those traditions. There's nothing in the Scriptures that tell you you have to keep those rabbinical traditions. You don't have to have a Jewish Seder. Read what the Scripture says itself in Exodus chapter 12, chapter 13, Leviticus chapter 23. And it's very simple. Keeping Passover is a very simple thing. And that's how we keep it here, very simple. And the reason we keep it really simple is because we have all of these remnant people who are from various tribes, various places, who are not Jewish. And it's not for us to start imposing Jewish traditions on people. So what we do is just very simply keep what the Scriptures say. And we find in doing this, this is what keeps us in vital touch with Messiah as He leads us on each Passover. This is where we find ourselves bound together in unity in Yeshua Messiah. And this is what He has blessed within our group. So, if you have let any of those traditions in the past separate you from the joy of keeping the Passover, you don't have to let that happen. Because as we can see from what Paul said, as we can see from what uh, Messiah said through the prophet Isaiah, we are set free from those traditions of men so that we can keep His Word in liberty along with the rest of the body of Messiah. So these are some things to think about. I wanted to talk to you about this in advance so you have some time to think about this before Passover and so that you can enjoy this coming Passover season in unity with His body. Mm -hmm.